is Ganesh Prasad Ramani, he's my mentor. Um, so today we are going to give a talk on emotional stress reduction using deep learning. The reason why uh, like, today is the very first talk here and uh, very first talk for me as well and uh, this is a very first public talk for me and I am literally stressed today <laughs> and my anxiety levels are too high, way high. And uh, yes, we are going to give a talk on stress now. So how many of you have ever experienced stress before? Can you please raise your hands? Okay. So many people, but still few didn't raise their hands. Stress is actually invisible. We do not know when it, we experience it, and uh, we do, it is actually invisible. And uh, I, we took this use case personally because uh, we, I had a personal experience uh, six months back or nearly eight months back, my mom had stroke and we took her to the hospital. They took all the tests, all possible tests and after five days, the doctor told my mom had stroke due to epilepsy and uh, she prescribed certain medicines and uh, after a month, we went to the hospital and we had some complaint. I told the doctor that my mom is not comfortable after taking the pills and uh, she is feeling very tired. And after taking enough sleep, even after taking proper sleep, she's, she, she still feels that she wants to sleep more. And I requested her to reduce the medication. The doctor replied to me like, the, way, the, the reason why I prescribed these medicines is because your mom was stressed for a long period of time. And I wanted her to take more rest. And that is the reason I have taken, I mean, she has given the medicines and uh, my mom has to take it. Probably if my mom is happy for a long time and if she's recovering well, then she can reduce the medications. Then we were th thinking, I was surprised to know that because she, my mom is fit and fine and we used to have a normal talk. Uh, she's an easy going person. And then uh, we can know that stress is invisible and it's, it's kind of a slow poison. And then we thought, uh, what if we can identify this in the, at the first place, even after go, waiting for a long time and then becoming it, it as a chronic stress. Then, um, we had a thought and uh, we were about to use the brain activity and uh, predict whether a person is in the stress state or not. And then we started this uh, use case. And this is completely a personal project and uh, we did it on our own interest. And um, yeah, so adding more to this, uh, more facts to this line, 89% uh, of the Indians are having stress issues. The symptoms are depression, lack of sleep at night, I have the problem, and uh, anxiety levels will be high even for little silly things. That's the reason, and uh, we shall go to the next slide. So, coming to the point, so uh, we are thinking to use, I mean, we use the brain activity, so there are many, uh, Techniques to extract the brain activity, I mean, for any, uh, say for example, a human brain. And uh, uh, we have uh, techniques like fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging, which is a tedious process and I do not prefer to go for uh, fMRI because I have to uh, take the fMRI and then collect the data. It is very uh, complex task for me. And it won't be helpful to train a model and then even for the inference purpose. And then we have ECOG, electro electrocorticograph, and that is invasive, and uh, most of us won't accept for it, right? And then we have the EEG uh, technique. So EEG, what it does is, it simply it extracts the brain activity. So uh, once a neuron fires, uh, it generates a spike, and uh, uh, the EEG device will extract this uh, electrical voltage of our brain, which is happening happening inside us. And uh, so we have uh, multiple, uh, five types of EEG waves and I'm going to talk about the alpha wave and the beta wave. So say for example, you're trying to solve a problem and it is a very difficult problem or you're trying to uh, take an important decision and your brain is very active now. So now lots of neurons will be firing and uh, the frequency of your EEG wave will be very, very high and the amplitude will be little less. That, in that case, you'll be in beta state. So we, let's talk about the relaxed state now. So when you're relaxed, when you're trying to rest yourself, the EEG waves will, frequency will be very less and the amplitude will be little more. 
So the frequency of alpha wave is uh, 8 to 15 hertz per second. And uh, frequency of beta wave is nearly like 14 to 30 hertz per second. This is it. So this is for a general understanding how our, our brain waves will be when we are resting and when we are stressed. So what, just think what will happen, we are, you are stressed for a long period of time. So your brain will be active for a long time and it is going to affect us. Next. So uh, we have two different uh, EEG devices here. This is a typical uh, 128 channel EEG devices. They, uh, these, this device will be used in the hospital. And uh, let me put forward a question before you. Which device would you like to use to uh, get your EEG wave? Right side, right? Yeah. Why? Yeah, exactly. So what happens in the hospital is in the medical institutions and research areas, they will apply the scalp. I mean, they will apply the gel on your scalp, and then uh, they will place all these all these pins are electrodes actually. They will place this electrode on the on our scalp and then take the EEG test, record the waves, and show the data. So that what this, that is what happening now. The headset which we have in the right side, right? That's called NeuroSky uh, MindWave headset. So this headset uh, will have only two electrodes. One is the reference electrode, that is the ear clip. We have to plug it on our ear. And the second electrode is the, uh, basically the sensor. So we have to place that sensor above our left eyebrow. So this will extract the prefrontal cortex activity of our brain. Shall we? Next. So the prefrontal cortex activity is responsible, is predominantly responsible for attention levels, meditation levels, all the facial expressions that we give. Whenever we blink, we think to blink, we think to smile, everything can be captured here. And, and the most importantly, the emotions, what we are in, this, in which state we are in. So all these can be captured uh, from the prefrontal cortex. So we, and luckily our headset, which we are using has the electrode which which extracts the prefrontal cortex uh, activity. And uh, the beauty of the, these devices are the uh, new, new, uh, newly available in the market. So uh, why uh, we have uh, the first headset is the NeuroSky, the second one is the Muse headset, and the third one is the Neuralink. And uh, NeuroSky is very cheap, but that's why I went with it. Because I just got it with, uh, by paying just 7,000 rupees. And the remaining are about 10,000. So it is very uh, easy for me to buy. And, uh, and yeah, all these electrodes have dry electrodes, so no need to worry about the gel and all. That's it. Next. And uh, these, all these electrodes uh, have uh, one to six channels. There are even um, new headsets coming, like Emoto Epo headset that has uh, 14 channels. And uh, so we, covered. we covered this this kind of So now coming to the data collection part. So this is the challenge we had. Uh, we have taken 10 subjects. We have considered 10 subjects whose age group differs from 8 to 63. Why? Because the EEG wave pattern won't be identical for, uh, for everyone. It will, be it, it will be different for each individual. So we consider this as a feature to, I mean, uh, to collect data, and which won't be uh, biased towards one particular individual. And then um, we took two states. One is when a person is in relaxed state and when a person is in stressed state. So uh, we try to make a person, I mean, whenever I feel relaxed and when my sister or my family members are relaxed or my friends are relaxed, I made them to wear this headset and collected the data and then uh, uh, saved it in CSV format and for training my data. The same way we try to record the EEG wave for when a person is in stressed state. It is very difficult to prepare data for stress state because, you know, uh, once my sister was very uh, frustrated after coming from her office, and then uh, she was telling me she was feeling bad. I was happy. Okay, feel, wait, wait there. I'll come with a headset and get your EEG data. And she was literally scolding me. Even when you are stressed and you are very angry or you are depressed, and if I go to you and ask you to share your EEG data, you won't be comfortable. So this, this was the main, I mean, this is the very, very basic challenge and important challenge that we faced. And we prepared nearly 250 to 300 episodes of data with 10 subjects. We did multiple episodes. And uh, that was not enough, that was not sufficient for us to train uh, any ML model. So what we had a thought is, why don't we use open data set? The problem with the open data set is we have uh, 
open data sets with multiple channel data. So we, because we have only one sensor, which, which is extracting the prefrontal cortex, and we don't know how to pre-process the open data set to train our model. So then what we thought is, uh, OK, we, we saw the data. We got a uh, uh, Dreamer data set. And uh, we had a couple of data sets from the Kaggle, which is open data set. And uh, what we identified is we had multiple channel data. And we focused only on the frontal cortex. We will be having multiple channels. So one, it will be kind of like multiple columns, F1, FE, F1, frontal 2, parietal 1. So frontal will be here, parietal will be uh, the back side. And we extracted only the frontal cortex data and then trained our model. We then uh, after training, we, uh, we freezed it and retrained our model using the data with which we have prepared. So this, this is the data collection part and data preparation part. So next, coming to the model preparation, model training, um, Mr. Ganesh will be explaining you. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Nadia. May audible? May audible? So uh, we talked about EEG and there are other uh, methods of collecting the data. Uh, EEG is the most affordable, but it's also the noisiest. Why? Because when you wear these headsets, the dry electrode headsets, uh, the only signal it is picking, it's not just picking the brain signals, it is also picking signals from your eyeball movement, blinks, your head turns, um, sudden muscle movements, all this, right? So it is noisiest and uh, separating the brain waves out of this uh, this data, the raw EEG data, is difficult, right? So there are lots of pre-processing step, uh, steps involved. Uh, for example, uh, you could apply an FFT uh, band filters or Butterworth band filters, and then separate only the alpha, beta uh, frequency ranges, right? But what happened is uh, we are entirely focusing on consumer uh, electricals, like uh, consumer devices. Um, if it is a standardized device, then you would get the same kind of uh, signals from all these devices. But we are looking at a scenario where any consumer device can, data can be used, right? So each EEG device has its own uh, way of sending the raw signals and has its own sample rates. So we cannot apply the same kind of pre-processing for all the devices. Um, so what we eventually uh, started doing is we, we did uh, separate the alpha and delta, uh, sorry, alpha and beta ranges train the model, but uh, it never actually gave us the accuracy. So we started giving the raw signal directly. What I mean by raw signal is it will be having all this muscle movements, eye movements, everything. And then we hoped uh, the deep learning model will actually segregate this artifact from the real signal. OK. Um, so again, um, if any of you are interested in the uh, pre-processing steps, there are uh, EEG lab is something developed for MATLAB. But it was also uh, migrated to Python. So you have EEG labs and other certain libraries in Python. Right, and then, uh, yeah, so EEG patterns also varied with age. We collected uh, from six different persons, sorry, 10 different persons 10 of different. different age groups. So it was also varying by age. And you would expect a child not to have some high frequency waves, but guess what? They do have to. So uh, age should also be considered as a input feature for this uh, uh, experiment. All right. So again, uh, she talked about public data sets. Uh, the main problem with the public data sets is they are not aligned with our goal. So we are trying to say whether a person is stressed or not. The public data sets are basically on emotion deduction, whether a person is happy, sad, uh, is he uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, emotionally aroused, those kind of emotions, right? So it's, all, it's on emotion deduction rather than stress deduction. So what we had to do, it's actually an adjacent problem, right? Like stress is also an emotion, or stress is a combination of emotions, whereas you have emotion deduction. So it's an adjacent problem. So we decided to take the data set, train a classifier on emotions, and then do a transfer learning for stress deduction. Uh, it did work well. Um, we used LSTM, again, as uh, we consider this EEG as a time series, so we went ahead with the LSTM-based uh, model. Initially, we did not have this attention. I'll tell you, uh, I'll tell you why uh, attention was needed. A pure LSTM model, uh, we'll talk about that in the next slide. But now here, uh, again, as I said, each device has its own sample rate. NeuroSky gives, a, gives you at a 512 hertz uh, sample rate, meaning it'll give you, for a second, it'll give you 512 uh, readings from the uh, brain waves, right? So for every second, you'll get 512 numbers. And then 
uh, we had to segregate it at 50 second segments, uh, 15, sorry, 15 se second segments, and then that uh, came to 7,500 uh, numbers per reading, right? So we had, we splitted this into multiple segments and then we uh, used it. Right now you should be thinking of why didn't this guy use convolution? I'll, I'll talk about it, right? So again, um, we, we just had a very limited architecture. We did not want to have a very big ar uh, neural architecture and then overfit our data. So we wanted to have a very minimal uh, neural network which can actually de de detect the stress and also uh, perform the transfer learning capabilities. Um, so initially we did not use our attention uh, uh, layer and what happened is the LSTM was not able to predict uh, uh, patterns at all. Um, on a binary classification, you know what's the meaning of 55% accuracy, right? So we had to use, so it, it was either convolution or attention for us. So we decided to experiment with attention first, and then it actually boosted up to uh, somewhere around 80, 85. Uh, but this is again, it's binary classification, so you know 85 is not good enough, right? So it, you still need to improve this further. And uh, this is, the other, other one is on the true positives, basically, uh, we were able to predict a stress rate with 62% true positive uh, score. And with attention, we were able to get it at 80%. So this is just identification of stress, right? So, yeah, so this is just identification of stress. And uh, that too, on uh, from a very uh, uh, consumer-centric, uh, these devices are basically for uh, the meditation assistance, okay? so. All these EEG devices, when they, you, if you see what they are uh, advertised for, it is a meditation assistance. You wear it and then you meditate and then the app uh, provided with this particular device will tell you whether you are actually reaching the meditative state or not, that kind of thing, right? So it was not basically actually mentioned for a stress reduction or any kind of uh, medical grade EEG detection. It was purely for fun's sake or to for another health. Uh, you can consider meditation as a health, so then it's a health sake. Um, so what we wanted to do was, uh, one thing that we wanted to try convolutions, uh, see, arrange this uh, data in a time period since, and then have a convolution record, uh, uh, work on it, so that it can find the stress and non-stress patterns, rather than looking at a long series of time series. So, so that 7,500 uh, digits is just for 15 seconds, so you could guess uh, what it's going to be for a prolonged session, right? So we'll have to convolute, and then see what, uh, how it actually reacts. The other thing what we wanted to do was, uh, see again, I cannot tell a person whether a, whether a person is stressed or not in 15 seconds, right? So it's a prolonged, it's a chronic stress that we have to look at. Uh, one other thing that we can try, uh, we are going to try is uh, signal embedding. In the sense, the EEG signal over a period of time, can we actually compress it into a low dimensional space, like w what your word word to wick are, but from a signal perspective. then. These signals, when we compress it into a low dimensional space, all the other uh, problems, your signal rate uh, differences, your EEG, uh, the raw EEG artifact defects, all, all of this goes away, right? So you could easily start comparing these embeddings from different devices very easily. Still it works, right? So that's the that's idea. And again, uh, more data collection, we are trying to see if we can crowdsource this actually and then have you people come and uh, give us data. Right, so that, that's also we are trying to do. Again, uh, so stress detection is not just from brain, you can also uh, detect stress from your skin. Uh, galvanic uh, skin response is a way to uh, detect stress. Um, on its own, it is 79% accurate uh, from the uh, studies that we are, they have done. So we are also trying to come up with a multimodal uh, method where you combine data from ECG, uh, ECG, again, um, how many of you own an Apple Watch? Yeah, so ECG, uh, heartbeat detection, all this comes uh, inbuilt in your watches. So wearables are the next thing. Wearables are going to come with uh, GSR probably in the future. And uh, this NeuroSky kind of devices are going to look really cool. You could just stick a small dot in your head or something like that, right? So all these devices together, uh, giving the signals and then can we detect a, detect a person's stress. That's, uh, that's another one. And again, so detecting the stress alone is not enough. You'll have to mitigate it. Uh, one study was about uh, how music actually, uh, uh, you know, mitigates or uh, relieves stress, right? Um, we are trying to see if we can create a GAN which can 
synthesize music or compose music from different sources, which, can, which is much personalized to a person's uh, stress pattern. And then it can, uh, there is also binaural uh, frequencies, which we can add, so to make the brain relax itself. So there are certain things that, uh, that's going on like this, and then uh, also word prediction. And word prediction is really tough. We don't know whether we can achieve it. But word prediction happens very deep in the uh, brain activity, whereas this EEG is on, on a uh, very small parts of the brain, right? So we don't know whether word prediction is possible. If it is, then it will be really cool. Um, basically, you could assist. Uh, see, again, this, uh, uh, if, you, if she would have mentioned that this entire project is for social cause, it was a personal project, and then we wanted to try to see how we can help people with technology. So we want to see, can we predict the words someone is thinking if they are not able to speak? Can we predict what uh, uh, word he is thinking, what is he thinking, and then express it outside? So that's, those are the uh, certain things that we did. And uh, yeah, that's, that's basically it from us. We have, yeah. No, it is different. That, that's the a, that's a reason we cannot use a normal rule-based engine right here. Uh, it, it actually differs from person to person. And then, uh, how would you say a person is stressed, right? So that's, that itself is a big question. I, for me, there is a good stress, and there is a bad stress. There is, uh, stress can also help you in certain things, right? But stress can completely degrade your health as well. So the, the definition of stress uh, from person to person, it, it differs. So it has to be the model that has to learn. We are not able to say. Exactly. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's horrible. Uh, to put a person in stressful. Okay. See, basically, um, one thing we did is we know that every office life is stressful. So. <laughs> Whenever they come out of the office, we try to get uh, collect data. Again, you cannot go to a stranger and then say, okay, can I get your EEG data? You're just from office I, and you look stressed. Thanks. No, right? So it has to be family and, uh, family and friends. We had to collect it ourselves. We know when we are stressed, uh, when we had a very bad day, you collect the data. You just make it positive by collecting this data. That's it. signals. Yeah. yeah. They are in the heart. What I feel is instead of taking an FFT, you would have taken a wavelet. It would have easily improved your accuracy. True. Why did you take FFT? It's not no, we did not apply any of these yeah. rules. Huh? We, we did not apply any of these transformations. We no, but had, you wrote FFT in that slide. We said uh, these are the pre-processing steps that the So can what I am saying in pre-processing, don't take the FFT. They sure. are not gigahertz or megahertz signal. Hmm. What literature says is for this low frequency signal, wavelet transforms much, much better. So instead of doing an FFT, you do a wavelet. It may increase your EIT4 to virtually to 90. Sure. <laughs> thanks, thanks. Like for when you are doing a BP measurement, if you go to the doctors and do the measurement, it will come out higher. So there is a concept of a medical BP. Does something like this happen for EEG also? Does measurement change the intent of measurement? Um, not that we see, but one thing that is possible is when, when you, are, when you uh, understand that you are being measured for stress, you actually relax. Okay. Right? It's the other so, way. Yeah. Uh, relaxed state is much easier compared to uh, calculating the stress state. And the difference in your accuracy, is that because of imbalance in the data? Or? No, no. Uh, we uh, made sure that the uh, data is balanced because we collected it. Right? So uh, the, the uh, problem in the accuracy is because of the EEG pattern. So the EEG is high frequency waves, so in the sense like 512 hertz per second. And then for a LSTM to, if you want to literally uh, take 15 seconds, it's 7,500 time steps. Mm -hmm. Right, it was not able to identify the pattern, and the readings are also very small, so it was not able to identify the pattern. So we applied our attention, see if it actually helps. Okay, thanks. Yeah. And to add more point uh, about his question, uh, we were discussing about the FFTs, but uh, in that is the pre-processing step which uh, we referred so many research papers, and they have used FFT 
initially we I tried I mean we tried with the FFT, but uh, I didn't see the accuracy increasing. That's that's the reason why we yeah. mentioned that we are using the raw EEG values. Correct. We one are, one thing uh, we probably uh, missed here is we did not pre-process the data at all. We just use the raw signals and then have the uh, LSTM attention to actually figure it out. So that will be mentioned in the last, last I mean, uh, the model architecture. Yeah. There we have mentioned that we have used the draw age value. We passed the draw age value and we forced the model to identify the pattern. Because I was able to understand, I mean, uh, see the uh, difference between the wave pattern for when a person is in relaxed state, when he was laughing, and it was a major difference. The amplitude was nearly 2,000 millivolts uh, when he was laughing. I mean, millivolts, microvolts, I guess. Because this headset will give you a, a microvolt. And when a person is in the uh, stress state, the amplitude never reached beyond that minus 200 to 200 millivolts. So uh, that was helping us. The raw EG value was helping us. Uh, no, we, not yet, not yet. Not so, uh, looking at the facial feature of the particular person and while wearing this headset and then when he's stressed, yeah, yeah no, no. Uh, we, we understand that there's a, uh, uh, you know, advantage to it, but we are not tried it yet. Uh, hi, yeah. hi. So, apart from uh, the stressed and relaxed features, did you also consider, let's say, the person is paralyzed and is not able to speak, he wants water. So based yeah. on the previous brain signals, we'll be able to make uh, out. That's, that's something that we wanted to try. We wanted to see if we can predict the words that he's thinking, but it was, it is actually difficult, right? So, but certain things like, so certain uh, ideas, like say, I want water, certain actions, if it is limited to a particular scope, you could train the person to think or uh, gain his attention or focus his attention on certain things, and then you could predict that pattern. Mm -hmm. You cannot predict the words directly, but you could, Transform that uh, instead of this language, word language, he could speak in a attention language. Okay, but then you can use the signals, um, yes. existing signals, and yeah. then. So, for example, Dreamer data set, it has 14 channels, yes. and uh, uh, FP1 and FP2 are two of that, right? So, for us, it's FP1 alone. We were just needed FP1 alone. We took only that channel from the data. Also, the labels were attached to it, emotions were attached to it. So, we were able to classify those emotions. It's, again, for, uh, when, I, when we are doing a uh, pre-training, it is not about the accuracy of the pre-trained model. It is basically whether the uh, model learns that particular task. The major difficulty that we are facing today is uh, consolidating all this public data into a single, uh, you know, single training set. Because each, uh, okay, so like when you select data from FR1 and FR2 channels uh, using a public data set, uh, like the data from FR1 Baseline also differs from the EEG device. So different data sets will have a different baseline. So we'll have to, when you combine these data sets, you'll have to merge it to a particular uh, common baseline, right? So that's, uh, our NeuroSky has a different reference point, uh, different baseline. Emotive has a different baseline. So that's the problem we are facing. That's why merging the data sets is the problem. That's when, that's when the embedding of signals can actually help you. So you can, you can embed this in a low dimensional space and then start comparing signals without worrying about the devices. Thank you so much, Ganesh and Nitya. Let's have a round of applause.